for your mercy never failed me in all my days. Hi, Hi guys. guys, happy, happy new month. My name is Sonia. Jean Neil. Hope you guys are doing well. And last month we covered the heart of a giver. Hope you are continuing to practice just like love and all the other requirements you're supposed to do as a Christian. So this month we'll be looking at sewing and reaping. But first, we'll praise and worship.
Welcome back from Praise and Worship. And now we'll be hearing from Pastor Hilary to the agenda. Enjoy. Praise the name of Jesus. My name is Hilary to the agenda, also known as Doc Hill. I'm a minister of the gospel. And um, I come to you with the word of the Lord, which is going to transform your life. You will never be the same again. Dear Holy Spirit, we pray for the power to bring forth, the power to communicate, and also for a quickening to receive, to assimilate these things, and to see them actually come to life and bear fruit uh, in us. In Jesus' mighty name, uh, amen and amen. I am talking about um, sowing and reaping. And uh, in talking about sowing and reaping, I think of first and foremost, number one, what has sowing and reaping got to do with giving? And uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5 to 7, that is answered for us. Uh, you'll notice Paul is talking about sending messengers to the Corinthians to prepare their giving. Um, and then he comes to uh, verse 6 where he tells them that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, he who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. And then in verse 7, he nails it and says, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, uh, uh, or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Notice he's connecting the giving in verse 7 to the sowing sparingly and reaping sparingly or sowing bountifully and reaping bountifully in the previous verse, which is verse 6. That is one, one scripture that answers that for us. The second scripture is Ecclesiastes 11, verse uh, 1 to 6, where Paul, uh, not Paul, but uh, <laughs> the preacher or the Ecclesiastes, Solomon himself, tells us, uh, cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days you will find it. And then he says that uh, give a portion to seven or to eight, for you do not know what evil shall come upon the earth, and then in verse 4, he comes uh, to the point of saying that uh, he who considers the wind will not sow. Notice that. He began by talking about casting bread on the waters, which he, he equated to uh, giving a portion to seven or to eight uh, persons, that is, and then comes now to calling it sowing without consideration of the wind or the rain. And then in verse 6, he also adds more emphasis by saying, sow your seed in the morning. Uh, and then in the evening also, do not withhold your hand. So again, you see, giving is being related to sowing and reaping. Now, uh, this, this makes people say, uh, but uh, aren't we turning giving into a selfish endeavor? You're giving to get. Well, nobody thinks of that when they, when they see a farmer going to the field to plant something expecting to get something at the end of it, at the end of the harvest. <laughs> Nobody thinks that person is selfish. Uh, but when it comes to the things of God, there's a pretense that comes where people think God, God doesn't want people who want to profit out of the things of God. Uh, but actually, he does want it. That's why he says in Luke 6, 38, give and it will come back to you. He's, he's, he's incentivizing you into giving. He's saying giving will do you some good. Uh, and because it will do you good, you should be motivated to do it. Give, and it shall come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And then in Acts 20, verse 35, uh, people will easily quote that and say, Jesus said, uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. <laughs> but even the people who say that, they, they forget that, that the reason they are trying to uphold that scripture is because of the very thing it promises those who adhere to it. Because that scripture is essentially saying that you get more out of it when you give than when you receive. So don't lie to us that you're not trying to get something out of it. You're trying to get more out of it, actually. That's why you, you're holding to the principle that the person who, who gives gets more out of it than the one who receives. So you're also giving to get. Get what? Get more out of it than the one who receives. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. Now that's very important for us. So um, the second thing we look at uh, when we talk about sowing and reaping uh, is uh, you reap what you sow. The idea in scripture that is given to us that you reap 
what you saw. That is in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Don't be deceived, God cannot be mocked. What, whatever a man sows, that's, that's what they reap. You reap what you sow. But when we say you reap what we sow, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that people try to over limit this scripture in, uh, in saying that, ah, no, 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 the scripture never said that um, uh, there are so many kinds of sowing and reaping and what. It just says there's only one sowing or one seed, and that is the word of God in Luke chapter uh, 8, verse 11. That's where they take that from. That You see, the, the Bible says that, um, <laughs> uh, that the seed is the word of God. So we don't sow any other seeds but the word of God. And then they even take it further and say, Galatians chapter 3 tells us that when the Lord told Abraham that in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed, he wasn't saying seeds but seed, and that seed was Christ. That's what they say. But then they forget that, wait a minute, Christ, if Christ is the seed, he's already been sown. He's already been sown. You are not going to sow Christ the way Christ was sown as a seed in Galatians, according to Galatians 3, verse uh, somewhere, I think, 13, 14 or something. That you are not going to be able to do that now because it's already happened. In fact, Jesus said, uh, in line with that, that unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone, but if it uh, fall to the ground and die, then it brings forth much fruit. That has already happened. You're not going to make it happen again. However, that principle of the seed being falling to the ground and dying and, and bringing forth much fruit is being applied in many other scenarios and in many other places. So um, the sowing of the, of the word cannot be the only seed, even if you, you, you take it to the, that far of saying that Christ is the only seed that can be sown. Why? Because the people uh, Paul was talking to in Galatians uh, were the ones being told to sow, uh, not sparingly, so that they might reap not sparingly. They were not being told to, to repeat what Christ already did by falling to the ground as a cone of wheat and dying and bringing forth much fruit. That had already happened. They, they definitely were not being told to reenact that. That had already happened. So whatever sowing they were being told was different. And I can, I, I, I can prove to us that that sowing uh, in the one of Second Corinthians 9 was a sowing of material things because he had already introduced uh, the discussion by talking about sending messengers to the Corinthians to prepare their bounty uh, so that by the time the giving of that bounty came, they were not hard-pressed to give it, they were not inconvenienced, and therefore it would come out as a matter of bounty than a matter of necessity or covetousness. And then he says, to commend them, he says that God uh, would, would cause them to reap bountifully if they then uh, sowed bountifully. Glory to God, as opposed to reaping sparingly for sowing uh, sparingly. Now, this is what I'm bringing out, that that in the scripture, when you survey the scriptures, you'll find there are actually other forms of sowing apart from the word of God. Uh, and the sowing of the word of God is the sowing of confessions. Um, the sowing, uh, the other sowing that the Bible talks about is like sowing of the wind in Hosea chapter 8 verse 7. It says some people have sown the wind and they've ripped the whirlwind. The Bible also tells us in uh, Proverbs 6.14 and 16.28 that some people have sown discord uh, and strife and war, <laughs> uh, glory to God, and of course they've reaped accordingly. And then in Proverbs eleven eighteen and twenty two eight, the Bible tells us of those who have sown unrighteousness and evil, glory to God. And then of course the one in Second Corinthians nine, which talks about sowing material things, which ends up as sowing money. By the way, um, uh, again we need to make a clarification. There are people who say that in the Bible days, when people talked about sowing, they were not talking about money, they were talking about produce and animals and things like that. Th that's really mistaken because when Jesus asked for the coin uh, that had Caesar's inscription on it, what was that? And, and when the people were asking, should we pay tribute or not, they were trying to, to ask him to distinguish for them or rather to, to make a, dis a, a demarcation where does the giving uh, to God uh, stop and where does the giving to the government stop? All around money. It wasn't giving to God produce and giving the government coins. It was all giving coins. 
the only difference that they needed Jesus to make for them was, do the coins all go to the government or do the coins go also to the, in quotes, church? There was no church by then, but what was like in the place of a religious establishment? Glory to Jesus. And you'll notice Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Again, not to say that the coins should all go to the government because... <laughs> Even in the in the tabernacle or in the synagogues, they would they would they would give to God what is God's in coin form. Praise the Lord, praise the name of Jesus. So we we need to to not be mistaken about that. Always money has been from the time it was invented merely a form of transaction or transfer of goods. Praise the name of Jesus. So uh, money in itself had no value of its own. It only had assigned value, and it was there in Bible times. It was there in Paul's times and the early church times. It is still there now, and as long as it is there and it is, uh, it is a, a, a what? a representation of value and goods, it will always come into the equation of giving. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. So let's not rule it out. It's very much a part of it. Now, I, uh, I would like to clarify as well that all these different forms of giving there are a few principles we need to see there in what you sow is what you reap we need to see that no form of sowing takes the place of the other which is what people have tried to do by saying we are only supposed to sow the word of god the way it was done in luke 8 11. not quite actually the sowing of one kind of seed is supposed to sow the other kind of seeds for you when the time comes to sow them. What I mean by that is that your sowing of righteousness is supposed to help you sow your sowing of peace for you when the time to comes, uh, comes to sow peace. And your sowing of material things is supposed to help you sow the seed of the word of God for you when the time of sowing the seed of the word comes. In other words, you having sown the seed of, of peace will facilitate the sowing of your seed of the word of God. By the word of God, I mean confessions, declarations you make about the word of God. And that is proven in, um, in Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 19, I believe, where it tells us that uh, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, uh, but in the previous verses, I think verse 17, it says, that uh, Paul is saying, I do not desire, I'm not telling you about giving because I desire your gifts, but rather I desire the fruit that should abound to your account. Now one time uh, I had a preacher preaching and he showed that the word that was translated account there means in your words, in your words. Notice sometimes when you speak words, you give an account of something. You give an account of a certain event that happened or we say that you are recounting the events of that night Glory to God. How? By words. So words account for certain things. But also it means account as like a bank account. Now notice this, the account of your words. In other words, the giving the Philippians were being encouraged to give was being encouraged because it was going to enrich the account of their words, the bank account of their words. In other words, their words would have um, <laughs> glory to God, proceeds to draw from if their giving had, had, had already been doing well. Praise the Lord. So your giving facilitates your sowing of the words. When you sow material things, you facilitate the sowing of words. When you sow words, you facilitate the sowing of peace. When you sow peace, you facilitate the sowing of righteousness. That's, that's what I'm talking about, that one seed sows the other seed for you. Glory to God. Now, the other thing is that one seed, the other side of it is that one seed is sown into another seed. In other words, when you sow peace, you're sowing that peace into the seeds of righteousness. You're, then you're also sowing the seeds of righteousness into the seeds of your giving. Then you're sowing the seeds of your giving into the seeds of um, what else? the seeds of, uh, of uh, <laughs> not wind or, or of progress, you know, praise the name of Jesus. Now, uh, he, James chapter 3 verse 18 does it well for us because it says that the seed or the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I thought that is a good illustration for us. It is showing that when I sow peace, praise the Lord, in sowing peace, I am simultaneously sowing righteousness in that sowing of peace. 
That's what I mean that one seed sows the other seed for you. The fruit of righteousness is the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So uh, realize that now uh, we crown it in 1 Corinthians 9:11, where we say that actually, when you really come down to it, uh, praise the name of Jesus, uh, it is not even an either sow this and get this, or sow the other and get the other. In any case. In 1 Corinthians 9.11, Paul says that if we have sown unto you spiritual things, can't we reap of your carnal things? In other words, he's saying that those who preach the word of God, they reap the material things of offerings, money, material things from the people. Uh, But at the same time, those people from whom they are reaping, uh, what they are reaping, are sowing those things that the preacher is reaping. When the, when the congregant is sowing material things, that congregant is, is sowing what the preacher is reaping, the material things. And at the same time, what the preacher is sowing, which are the spiritual things, is what the congregant is reaping. So that means that when, a, a body, when the body of Christ wants its, the quality of ministry to grow, the body of Christ should invest in that by their material things. That is what will produce a windfall. <laughs> it is what will produce a return in form of spiritual uh, growth uh, or spiritual development on the side of the ministers. The ministers will be of higher caliber and greater quality and will have more forthcoming uh, glory to God. They'll have more spiritual stuff to give when they are invested in by the material things of the people. And that is explained all and uh, all through the scripture. So I really wanted to show that what you sow is what you reap should be understood also in this light that what makes it spiritual or carnal is about what how, uh, what um, it's about glory to Jesus. It's about the attitude or the motive with which it's given. Jesus said, "If you give to be seen, you have your reward. You will be seen." But also, you'll notice that if you don't give to be seen. What does he say? Your father who sees in secret will reward you, which means the same act can be carnal or spiritual based on the motive. If your motive is, is, is uh, out of respect to God, then your giving is spiritual. But you're giving a material thing, a carnal thing. Just like Paul said, we want to reap your, your carnal things. You're giving a carnal thing, but that carnal thing has been rendered spiritual by your motive of giving it as unto the Lord. But then when you give it out of selfish motive, then that very thing is turned into a carnal thing, even if it were a spiritual act. <laughs> it is a carnal spiritual act, just like the other one is a spiritual carnal thing. Praise the name of Jesus. I, I, I hope you see that. Um, glory to Jesus. And Jesus said that in Matthew 6 a lot. Eh? So now we come to number three, is how much you sow versus how much you reap. <laughs> so you notice we talk about... Um, Number one, uh, what has sowing and reaping got to do with giving and receiving? Number two, we talk about what you sow is what you reap, which we have shown uh, in beautiful light in the scriptures. And then number three, we talk about how much you sow. <laughs> now, of course, we've already seen a bit of that. Second Corinthians 9 talks a lot about it, verse 5 to 7 to 12, actually, as well. Then also in Galatians 6, it tells us uh, in verse 8, to share in all good things with our teachers. And then it says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked for whatever a man sows, that shall a man reap. Now notice this. When we say how much are we to sow, (laughs) or how much is the the magnitude of your sowing uh, got to do, how much does does how much you sow uh, have to do with what you reap or how much you reap? Glory to Jesus. And uh, uh, that is explained in saying, Uh, that he who sows sparingly, sparingly is a measure, it's a magnitude. He who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. He who who sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. But now this is not a very straightforward uh, thing when you think about it because here is a scenario. Jesus stands, like we said, at the offering plate. He stands to observe what people are giving in the offering plate and they were giving bundles of money, remember? So for people who are telling us that money wasn't uh, uh, what people had in mind in Bible days, they're mistaken because Jesus stands at the offering plate in his days and people are bringing money. 
money coins they were not bringing animals or produce <laughs> they were bringing coins and and the like and when he stood there he saw those who brought bundles and so on and then he saw a certain woman who brought two mites or two coins and then jesus uh said to his disciples i tell you the truth this woman has given more than all the others who have given um the the big bundles of money so now this brings a a, a, a dilemma <laughs> What does it mean that he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, he who sows bountifully? Because the other people who brought bags of money seem to have sown bountifully. Uh, glory to Jesus. But now you see, uh, that makes us think of other things as well. It makes us think that, that actually the bountifulness of your giving um, can be looked at first of all from what do you have? Remember, uh, first Cor Second Corinthians eight twelve tells us that a man's gift is accepted not based on what he does not have, but on what he has. Praise the name of Jesus. In other words, what is much or little depends on what you have, and not on what you don't have. In other words, we do not judge, or the Lord does not judge, that Timothy gave a lot, or Harry or Huntington gave a lot or little based on what uh, Matthew has on what, uh, uh, you know, Philbert has. He judges Philbert on Philbert's own merit and judges Harriet on Harriet's own merit. You see, it's judged or it's accepted based on what a man has and not on what a man does not have. So for that woman who gave two mites, based on what she had, which Jesus said was only those two mites. In other words, the two mites were all that she had. She had given more than all the others. In other words, the others who gave bundles of money and here we are safe in, in concluding that the ones who gave the bundles of money and so on did not give as much based on what they had. I hope you can see that. That is very clear cut. So you're judged based on what you have. That's how, uh, that's how much or little your giving is. But also Jesus, added, Paul added something in chapter 9, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, verse 7 and 5. He said, uh, verse 7, first of all, he said that uh, let every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give. For God loves a cheerful giver, um, uh, praise the name of Jesus. Now you'll notice again he's bringing something sweet here. He's showing that the degree of cheerfulness or the lack thereof is what ends up as a measure of whether what you've given is sparing or not. Isn't that interesting? Because he began, notice, by saying that, that your giving should not be grudging or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. But he said this in the same breath as when he said that when you give sparingly, you will also reap sparingly. Notice that when someone is not cheerful, the cheerfulness you have is the measure of the openness of your hand. The more uncheerful, the less open your hand. The more cheerful, the more open your hand. Ha <laughs> ha, glory to Jesus. Now, so this is what we, we need to catch, uh, catch on to, that your giving is much or little based on what you have. Paul said that it is accepted not based on what a man does not have, but on what a man has. The second thing about it is that it is much or little based on how cheerful or how less begrudging uh, uh, you are about it. The more begrudging you are, the more sparing your giving is, however much it is in, in quantity. I may give 10,000 or 10,000 of whatever item it is, uh, and someone may give 2,000, but the, if I give 10,000 with relatively more begrudgingness than the one who gives the 2,000, I have given less than the one who gave the 2,000. I hope that we see that this is really, really awesome for us. So when we talk about giving and receiving, now let's flip it to the receiving side. When you, let's say you have given much or little, and we're talking about when, when, when the Bible tells us that you're going to reap little or much. Little or much on your side is different from little or much on his side, even if they are equated, that, that you gave little and also God is going to make sure you get little. Remember... Uh, that your hand and God's hand are of different size. When What is little for an elephant is not what is little for a rabbit. <laughs> and comparatively, when, when we speak figuratively, obviously God is omnipotent and we are not. God is all-consuming and we are not. So the size of his hand 
or rather let's say that because he gives according to the size of our hand of his hand and we give according to the size of our hand what is little on our side of the equation uh, when it's equated with what is little on his side of the equation uh, is two different things praise the lord in other words what is little on his side may be the cattle on a thousand hills and um, <laughs> the silver and the gold for he says they are his praise the lord now what is little for someone like that is is not what is little for me even if equated so it means that when when you sow sparingly and you reap sparingly even the sparing that is from god will still be way 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 so generous uh, 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 compared to your little <laughs> praise the lord however it will it will still feel like it is not as good as it would have been if you gave bountifully praise the lord so i wanted to make that point there that you will still feel um, that it is less it could have been more if you had been more unsparing glory to god for if god is unsparing where you're concerned i'm telling you the benefit far outweighs it far outweighs praise the lord you're holding on to be sparing with the little that you have praise the name of jesus so let's take that into account how much you sow versus how much you reap depends on uh, what you have and not what you don't have secondly it depends on your cheerfulness or the lack thereof and then thirdly uh, it's understanding that god gives according to the size of your hand for the giving on your side which is also according to the size of your hand so what is little on your side uh, compared to the little on his side is big. It's a big difference. Hallelujah. So um, uh, glory to God. What is much on his side compared to what is much on your side is far outweighs the other. So it means you should be that much more motivated to give much because you can never outgive God. Like we've been told so many times. You can never outgive God. You give and then he says it will be given back to you good measure pressed down shaken together running over praise the name of jesus and we are keeping in mind in all this by the way that um that it's not just giving one thing or the other material or righteousness or peace or um what did we talk about or sowing uh instead of sowing the wind uh where you sow that which which it remains up to eternity glory to god if a work, man's work remain uh glory to god then also sowing the word of god we are saying actually that this principle of what you the the sowing sparingly is reaping bountifully applies to all those forms of sowing and their relationships and it also applies to what we said that when you sow spiritual things you can reap carnal things as a benefit just like when you sow carnal things you can reap spiritual things knowing like what it says in first timothy 4 verse 8 that uh, godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come praise the lord godliness is a spiritual act but that spiritual act is profiting you in all things so when we say you sow sparingly and reap sparingly, you sow bountifully and reap bountifully, we mean that when you sow god godliness, we are including the fact that when you sow godliness sparingly, you will reap all things sparingly. When you sow godliness bountifully, because godliness is profitable unto all things, you will reap all things bountifully. Just like also when Paul sowed spiritual things and expected to reap carnal things from the church, if he sowed those spiritual things sparingly, he would reap uh, those carnal things from them uh, sparingly. And if he sowed bountifully his spiritual things, as in the preaching, the ministering, he was entitled to reap bountifully from their carnal things and vice versa. The people he was reaping from were, were sowing what he was reaping and what he was sowing in them they were reaping <laughs> so if they if if they if he sowed sparingly uh, they ended up being only able to sow sparingly in him and if he reaped uh, if they uh, sowed sparingly in him because he had only invested little in them they they were only able to see him return unto them or cause them to reap sparingly from what he had so this is very important now our last point for today glory to god is uh, on the timeliness <laughs> how many times do you sow and for how long do you sow 
at least we know in the scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, um, the Bible tells us that there's a time to sow and there's a time to reap, just like it tells us about other things, a time to give birth, a time to grow old, a time to die, a time to live, a time for war, a time for peace. It tells us there's also a time to sow and a time to reap. Glory to God. So we want to understand the timeliness about giving. When do you sow? How many times do you sow? And for how long do you sow? Since there's a time to sow, we need to know what time is that. When we look at chapter 11 of Ecclesiastes, where we've already read, where it told us, cast your bread upon the waters. Ecclesiastes 11 from 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days you will find it. Give a portion to seven or to eight, uh, for you don't know what evil shall come upon the earth. And it says, when the clouds are full, they bring forth the rain. Uh, it talks about he who considers the wind shall not sow. He who considers the rain shall not plant. Uh, glory to God. Now look at this. That it's saying that the person who sows does not consider the rain, does not consider the wind. That gives us an insight. We could see, think of it in, a, in a, a figure of speech where uh, we can say that that is as good as saying sowing is not according to fair weather. It's not fair weather sowing. It's not according to when conditions are good. We don't sow based on, on uh, is it convenient, is it not convenient. We actually sow uh, based on as much opportunity as we have. If you think about those verses, if you look at them critically, notice they bring out the fact that um, uh, you should sow in the morning. Notice verse 6 says, sow your seed in the morning and in the evening do not withhold your hand. And it is saying that in the context of, of verse 2, which said, give a portion to 7 or to 8, because you don't know what evil shall come upon the earth. It's actually telling you that you should give um, with every opportunity that presents itself. That's the, the right time to give. The right time to give is to give for as long as there is opportunity to give and to give with no regard for circumstances because you know that any one of those moments can be your windfall. It can be your moment of what? Turning everything around. Praise the name of Jesus. Because he says in verse, uh, remember like we said in verse 6, he says, sow your seed in the morning and in the evening do not withhold your hand because you do not know which shall yield or which shall return or which shall bring returns, whether it is this or that. In other words, whether it is the morning sowing or the evening sowing, you do not know. That is why you use every chance you have. You use the morning chance, the afternoon chance, every chance you can get because any chance can be the windfall for you. Praise the name of Jesus. But another way of looking at it, of what time is right for sowing and reaping, is to think of when the Bible uses the term fast. It says seek fast the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Remember this was in the context of don't worry what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Matthew chapter 6 or how you will be clothed, verse 25 uh, to 33, uh, for the, the lilies uh, of the field do not toil, they don't spin, they don't, you know, clothe themselves, so the, but the Father clothes them. They have greater glory than what Solomon had. The, the sparrows are not, uh, they don't gather into bands, but your heavenly Father feeds them. And then notice what he comes to. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. God, these, all these things, the Lord knows that you have need of. All the Gentiles seek after these things, and your Father knows that you have need of them. Uh, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This is my point, that uh, seek first the kingdom has the element of put God first. Now, when it comes to, to, um, to, to sowing, there is an idea of putting God First, remember, we have this belief, according to 1 Corinthians 3, verse uh, uh, 6 to 9, that it is God who gives the increase. We sow, we water, but it is God who gives the increase. Now, because we know that, we put God first. And putting God first actually means give him the first, the best. That's why we have the principle like that of the tithe uh, or the one of the first fruits. The idea there is that the right time to give or to sow is fast. Let the giving go fast before the, <laughs> the keeping. Before you think about how much you can keep, think about how much you can give. Think fast to give before you think to save. 
It doesn't mean forget about saving or ignore saving, no. But think of giving first and then of saving second. Praise the name of Jesus. People think it should be the other way around, but it's actually not that way. The Bible says that the generous soul shall be uh, enriched. It says, he who withholds more than is necessary shall tend to poverty. Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. Now, what am I saying here? I'm saying that uh, the right time to give is to give first. When you tithe, uh, but tithe after having done a million things with your money, uh, there is something that's been lost there. You've lost the sense of timing. Hallelujah. That it's not just tithe because it is the tenth, but it's also tithe because it's the tenth off the top. So if it's off the top, it's the tenth that, is, that goes first, and then you have the rest of the money left to you. But that principle can also apply to other things, that, that in your life you should think of giving first before you think of saving. That doesn't mean don't think of saving, no. But think of giving first. Think of what you can give. And then think of the other first. Why? Because the Bible says that he has scattered abroad, he has dispersed and given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. And then he says that, um, that uh, he who withholds more than his meat shall tend to poverty, but he who gives or he who waters shall himself be watered and the generous soul shall be made rich. I'm telling you, this will change your life when you think about it. Think of giving first. Uh, think of seeking God first, or rather putting God first. And how? He says in Proverbs 10, uh, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of your increase. Is it Proverbs 10 or Proverbs 3? Somewhere in there. It says, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of your increase. So shall your bands be filled with plenty, and so shall your vats overflow with wine. Oh my goodness. That is important. Now, uh, lastly, on that point, is that uh, for how long do we give? Remember, we give as much as there is opportunity, and then uh, we, we give, not, it's not a fair weather giving, we don't give in good conditions or bad conditions, we give for as long as there is opportunity, despite the weather, despite the circumstance or the convenience. And then also we give fast, we think of giving fast, both in the sense of the fast fruits, the tithe, um, but also in the sense of thinking of God first. When we have our money, when we have things uh, in our possession, we think of God first, and then the other things next, or ourselves next. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. And lastly, uh, now I'm saying, uh, for how long do we give? And this is the interesting thought that came to me is, we give until what we are giving towards gives. You know, there's an English expression that, that when the supernatural comes into contact with the natural, something has to give. And in, a, in American form of language, what, they, what that expression means that it gives way, or it gives in, or it breaks, or it, it, it can't hold it anymore. Now, in our sense, we give until the thing that we are giving towards gives. Until it gives, until it gives, until it lets go, until it lets loose. Now, in the Old Testament, people used to do that figuratively uh, in the sense of when they would give like towards the building of the tab uh, temple and tabernacle, they gave so much that David had to say, hey, you guys, it's too much. They gave until Moses had to say, it's too much. Now, that corresponds with the biblical principle of due season. The Bible say, says, don't be wary in well-doing, Galatians 6 uh, verse 9, don't be wary in well-doing or doing good, uh, <laughs> praise the Lord, don't be wary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap a harvest if you faint not. I've all, I, I, I tend to think about that expression, in due season is when? In due season is usually later than you would like it to be. <laughs> That's what one man of God said. Another way of looking at due season is that you give what is, how do you know what is due? See, for due season, how do you know what is due? You give as if you're giving your dues until you feel you have given your due. Now, that is instinctive. Nobody can really tell you when what you've given is the due. Or what you've given is what you are due to give or is what is due. It is you who will feel it. And usually that will be later, much later than you would like. But if you stick it out and give until 
what you're giving towards gives. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You are going to see a harvest return to you. Praise the Lord. And the word does not lie that in due season you will reap a harvest if you faint not. My friend, all I'm encouraging you to do is to give, keep giving what is due as if you're giving dues until the day that you feel that I have done my due. And that day, nobody will talk you out of it. You will know that you have done it. And that will be like the last straw that breaks the donkey's back. Praise the name of Jesus. You will be blessed. Hallelujah. Hope you are blessed by the word. Now it's time to give. Feel free to send your tithes and offerings to the following contest. For those on Airtel, 0701 for those on MTN, 0772-811-339. All registered to Alinda Flavio. The AYC is 25 days from now. If you haven't registered, please follow the link in the description to register. And see you there. Remember, we are coming to you live on the team. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook and we'll be giving you updates. Bye-bye. You have been so, so good With every breath that I have made Oh, I will sing of the goodness